All right, so I recently came across this idea of compression is the same thing as artificial general intelligence or just intelligence. Like they're basically solving the same problem. I, I just love this idea. It intuitively makes sense to me. And Marcus Hutter has kind of formalized a definition of intelligence, like mathematically. And I don't want to just, you know, take his word for it that, you know, he's formalized our um, intelligence and just say that like, oh, okay, that's what intelligence is then. It's what Marcus Hutter has said. So I understand there's going to be some controversy around this definition of intelligence and seeing intelligence in this way. And I'm not trying to say here that this is this is the definition of intelligence. This is what intelligence is all about it is it is compression and and we can move forward with the de definition of intelligence that Marcus Hutter has defined for us. That's not what I'm saying. What I am, why I am interested in Marcus Hutter and his definition of intelligence is because it gives us something to go off of and it, it at least gets some interesting ideas moving. So for me, as a um, budding researcher, entrepreneur, engineer in the space of artificial intelligence and software engineering i hear something like a you know, the ideas of marcus hutter and it is inspiring it is inspiring for me on a practical level as well as on a bigger like philosophical level on like a big picture and the ultimate direction of things so i, I want to talk about those two those two parts of the puzzle so first of all let's just let's just go with this idea of intelligence is the process of compressing of compression if we just think about the systems that we live in and we are a part of the human systems that we are a part of think about the world right now in 2020 um, with with all that's going on with covid and the influence that that's having in our political systems as well as um, in our economic systems there's so much going on right now. There's so much information. And the worldview that you're operating with in this time really comes down to your ability to take in this information, maybe selectively, you know, maybe you want to filter out some of it, but take in information nonetheless and compress it into some meaningful representation, into some meaningful story. And then that's the lens that you are seeing the world through. That's very difficult to do. It is, it, it's extremely difficult to do. And I think it's becoming even more difficult. I think we can, we can stop saying that it's becoming more difficult. It's because the world right now, we are at this like peak point. We are at this moment of time where there is an insane amount of information coming at us. And I think we might have hit our peak. I don't think we can really get much more if you think about like the access to information that we have through the social media apps i don't even want to call them social media apps let's just say technology the access to information through technology and the systems that have de been developed to to feed us this information in a way that um it's con it controls our perception even if it's very it's it's almost it's sub subconscious almost because we we aren't even fully aware that it's happening but it is happening so the system there's such a, a flood of information and there's massive amounts of uh technological systems that are directing the flow of information towards us and doing so in an intelligent way I don't think that we can we can get any bigger. Like the floodgates can't get any bigger. I don't think that the the transfer of information coming in is going to increase because the we're starting to hit limitations on our own ability to receive information. So you you could alter the technologies, you can make more information available on the technological end, but the reception through our brains is, is just hitting a peak. And the peak 
is re it really has something to do with like our ability to just maintain sanity because this flood of information is breaking down our psychological well-being so this is um something that uh like has recently been introduced into the public sphere of information in a more mainstream way through the the documentary the social dilemma i think many people were already aware of many of the points that the social dilemma is bringing up but the social social the social dilemma is formalizing uh the those ideas and putting it into a very easily digestible format for many people to take in and to then have discourse about those topics so now we have this we have this understanding of what the tech companies are doing to us and you know there there are a lot of issues with the information information censoring but the main point that i'm talking about is just the fact that it's there the fact that we have all this information and you as an agent operating in the world you want to develop a world view some perce a perception of of the world that you live in well your job as an agent is to take all this information and to compress it into some meaningful format that you can easily digest and upload into your own brain um, as as a part of your lived experience that's an important part i think of of being an intelligent agent is that you you need to you need to compress the information but then put it into use put it into practical usage and i think that just thinking about intelligence in general that that's that kind of seems to be what's what's happening that you put it, you create an agent in in artificial intelligence um and this agent is is operating within some world with with some specific set of goals because if if there are no goals there's no there's no real um there's no way of uh of creating models of the world that the agent is living in then it's just chaos and there's no there's no need for artificial intelligence there's no need for that type of emergence to occur but if there are a set of rules to operate by then you can you can start to develop goals and you can start to formalize those goals and thinking about us uh you know we we are living in a world we are living in a world that has been constructed partly i think uh as a byproduct of of just this of the complex system of human beings living and, and operating together with on the world that the the world that we live in is is emergent from this complex system but we are trying to operate within this complex emergent system and as an agent you know your goal first is just to figure out what the heck is going on here what is happening here and what how do i choose the rules by which to live how do i choose the set of actions that i need to take so the the mindset that i've kind of been operating in has been this one of capitalism i see the world in sort of in a capitalistic perspective and the actions that i think about taking are lar in large part related to the market and success in the market. I want to take actions that lead to success in the market. And if you think about like the games that we play as as intelligent agents, one of those games is uh, your movements in the market. And it's really hard to compartmentalize the games that we play as human beings because you can't really just say, well, part of me as an agent is playing the game of capitalism and trying to be a successful agent in the market and then this other part of me is trying to be successful in reproducing and spreading my genetics so that basically means building a family and then also another part of me is you know trying to win social relationships all of these things are connected they're all part of the same thing. It's very difficult to compartmentalize and just break them apart. They're all part of the same thing. So if your your choice is around being successful in the market, you're you you might be doing that in order to increase your probability of building a successful family. 
and having those relationships. There might be some value that you're generating for yourself that's going to make you um, more likable by others and therefore more likely to find a partner to, to build and grow your own family with. So uh, your ability to take in the information of the world and to compress that into a reasonable story by which to live and then put that into production as it as it were which is basically putting that into your brain you know embedding that into the biological structure of your brain so that you can just push go like your your living your lived experience is then uh seeing how that model plays out and i think as as human beings as agents we are constantly needing to reconstruct deconstruct our models of the universe and some people are good at that some people aren't good at that and you know different different people or different agents are seem to be good at different parts of this problem like some people are are have the ability to formalize a a very solid model that uh to like a very solid set of principles to act in the world and to be successful but maybe they don't really have the ability to deconstruct that model and to see things in a different way and then there are there are those who maybe just can't really seem to get that model right, just can't really get that model working correctly, but they have the ability to rapidly deconstruct their model and uh, and then plug in a new one and just do this trial and error and, and find really successful strategies of winning that way. One of the things that I've seen in my life, I'm 30 years old now, and one of the things I've seen is that as you're when you're younger, the model that you're operating with is much more fluid, and it's way easier to change it. And in fact, it's it's like not even really permanent. It's it's changing all the time by itself. It's just being updated constantly by itself. Uh, and one of the things that happens is as you get older, is that the model sort of stays locked in place for longer, and it's a little bit more difficult to pull that thing out and do like retrain your model on new perceptions of the world you kind of get locked in to your to your percept uh to your to, to the model that you're operating in and the the main issue with this is that now all the data that's coming in to your system is being filtered through this model and so all of your data is biased data now it's it's going through your your model and if you do any type of updating on your model it's with your biased information it's with your biased data so being able to to take out your perception and reach and and think in a new way that's that's a really important skill to to gain and and perhaps you know i'm correlating it with age but maybe uh there are methods for learning to 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 this as a skill to take down your model and to update your models of the world i think that the ways to do that would be things like meditation uh where you it's meditation is a very very long process like you can't it's i'm not saying like you just sit down and meditate for an hour and all of a sudden you're going to be able to shift out your mental perception of the world and update it with a new one that's not how meditation works at all but meditation, the skill that you can gain and the understanding of how your own inner system works, uh, that that is acquired through years of practice, usually years of and maybe you don't even need to call it practice. It's just sitting with yourself and going inward. Uh, if you if you acquire that as a skill, as an as an ability, I believe that you can you can main you can maintain fluidity in your mental models for your entire life and i think even on the biological end of, of things that there's evidence to support that that's possible in terms of like the uh the, sh the actual structure of your brain because uh, plasticity is uh has been shown i don't i can't really cite the papers right now but from what I've read, uh, they have shown that plasticity maintains itself well into um, l uh, later life. So in like your 70s and 80s, like the brain still remains 
uh, in some form of plasticity. So the, the main ideas that I, I was talking about, though, are related to compression and intelligence. It's useful as a mental model, to say the least. Maybe it's not the definition of intelligence. Maybe we, we still have a lot to learn in that. And I, I like keeping that flexibility there. I think that's what science ultimately tries to give us. Like it, it, we can present hypotheses and if we can, if we can back them up, it doesn't mean that you've proved something. It just means that you've presented a, a, a potential reality um, and you've done so where you've presented it in a falsifiable way. And I, I, I want to read more about the work of Marcus Hutter to see in what way he has formalized his definition of intelligence um, to better understand that. Because I think that it, it could really offer a lot uh, to, the, to the practical implementation of artificial intelligence solutions. And he also gave some great book recommendations in the Lex Friedman podcast, um, just talking about like how to get into artificial intelligence and reinforcement learning. And I think that those will be interesting things to look at too. It seems like we're still at a Oh, we're still kind of hitting a wall in our in our um, attempts at building artificial intelligence systems and especially using reinforcement learning. And the wall that we're hitting, um, it seems like has to do with the computation, the the memory footprint of some of the models that we are creating, just in general, the efficiency of the computation that we are that we have available to us. And I think also the amount of data too, because even if you think about us, like they, they, it's so common that I hear this where they talk about like human beings being this general intelligence system where you only need to show limited amount of data, right? You only need to show me a few examples of, of numbers and I can learn, like you don't need to show me millions of pictures of the number one for me to learn that that's a number one. But what it's missing out on is the fact that my brain uh, has evolved over millions, maybe even billions of years. I don't know the exact time frame, but we have to go back to like the initial, whatever our descendants were, like going back to the very initial forms of DNA, maybe even RNA, if you're familiar with RNA world, um, and that the formation of, of that information, because that's when the information started started to get encoded and maybe in these in this specific brain structure uh, maybe we don't need to go all the way back to like RNA talking like when we're first start, starting out as in the RNA world but the formation of this specific brain structure uh, at the very least we have to go to the time frame when when the organism that we once were had eyes and we were taking in information visually so if we're if we're talking about the visual system so at that point in time, we started to imprint uh, some information pattern recognition. And that system uh, had the opportunity to, to evolve and to learn and to try out different variations. And there's, there's like uh, a genetic algorithm at play too, where it's like forking itself out and it's trying out different, different, um, different variations among offspring like the the genetic algorithm that you can read about um, that you can implement in in computer systems is based on the genetics of of like our understanding of genetics how genetics actually works and this the genetics was actually like this genetic algorithm was actually at play and there's there's like the big the big picture genetic algorithm that you can look at you can look at like an individual and their descendants but then within that, if you zoom into the systems, like within the systems, there's actually like um, cellular and biochemical genetic algorithms at play as well, where there are very subtle changes and shifts in these in uh, the in the offspring that are produced. And like some of the offspring could have been loaded up with uh, machinery for for slightly modifying the expression of certain genes within the lifespan. So there's also like the genetic algorithm that that is that is playing out at the human scale is happening. Like it's not just like, all right, I'm going to produce an offspring and boom, send them out into the into the world. There's actually like, all right, I'm going to produce an offspring and load them up with the machinery to adapt to the world and to learn and to change over time. So when we're taking an example of human beings being able to learn from limited amounts of data, 
we're not talking about the same algorithms that we're that we're teaching uh you know with mnist data set we're talking about algorithms that that are operating at multiple scales and this is difficult for people to think about it's happening at multiple scales it's happening at a cellular level it's happening at a biochemical level and if you really go down to like if you keep going down in biochemistry it basically becomes physics so it's happening at a physics level as well all right that's it for this video here today if you like this type of content be sure to subscribe to the channel and like the video i'll see you next time